Hey there, thanks for joining us for another edition of The Download, where you get the best in Catholic discussion. I'm Simon Rafe, but of course you already knew that. And with us today are Bradley Eli, who's happy to return after the show's Simon, long hair. It's good to be here, Brad, good to be here. And of course, Mike Voris is here once again. Thanks, our, Simon. Our major topic today is, well, it seems the Democrats are trying to hijack the election. They're pretty much saying that out loud. I didn't just make it up. But first, let's look at today's top stories. Yet another faithful Catholic priest is being thrown under the bus. There's Catholic oppression in Australia still, and President Trump has a new list. Brad, start us off. A priest is being silenced for speaking out. La Crosse, Wisconsin Bishop William Callahan is condemning Father James Altman for saying a person can't be Catholic and a Democrat in a video released last week. Callahan's statement issued yesterday calls Altman divisive and also calling him angry, judgmental, and lacking charity. The statement finishes with a threat saying, quote, canonical penalties are not far away if my attempt at fraternal corrections do not work. Well, I, you know, Altman's my hero. When I grow up someday, and <laughs> I want to be, 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 be Father Altman. Yeah. I mean, if people haven't seen that video, um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's all over the place and now. if you vote Democrat, you vote Democrat Catholic, you go. you're going there. I, I think it's just, it's just a very, very good video. One thing that the bishop does say in his statement, and this is actually kind of the thing that makes his statement all the more bizarre is he says that he understands the undeniable truth that motivates the, the Father Altman's video. So it's like, so you're saying that this is true, but you're still going to punish this oh, guy? Oh, he didn't condemn well, him for anything he said. He was just his tone. Yeah, that's just it. I mean, we're familiar with this criticism here. Oh, it's not what you say, it's your tone. tone. Yeah. You know, a couple things on this. So first of all, the bishop says, uh, you know, I, I'm doing what the gospel say, which is to, you know, I'm doing this privately. How, really? is, how is issuing a statement to the world private, first of yeah. all? And second of all, if you, and he, he makes the thing about, well, you know, we don't condemn groups and stuff like that. Uh, let's substitute this for a second and say that Father Altman had done a video about the KKK or about the Nazi party. Yeah. Would the bishop have put out a, a statement and said, well, we don't condemn groups, groups and their ideology. Yeah. Really? Well, which particular member of the KKK who supports KKK ideology uh, do you think is acceptable and not condemnable? Yeah. You know, racists and alt-right and all this, they're always they're, being They're always quite happy by... to condemn. condemn. But, I mean, and to be fair, the church has gone around and condemned ideologies and groups for the longest time. We condemn Protestantism. We condemn we, socialism. We still condemn them, Protestantism, yeah. although you would know since you, most of well, the, bishop, I, most of the sure bishops are Protestant. Do. Yes. Oh, that's going a bit mm. far. I wouldn't even say most more Protestant. Uh, well, that's true. Yeah, there'd be you no. Know, our apologies to any Protestants that would be listening. <laughs> In other church news, Australian lawmakers are attacking the seal of confession. Yesterday, the state of Queensland in Australia voted to force priests to tell authorities if they learn about child sex abuse while hearing confession. Earlier this year, the state of Victoria, obviously also in Australia, passed a similar law with some priests responding they won't comply, fearing people will simply stop coming. The church forbids priests revealing confessional content for any reason, as, as it should. Uh, you, something interesting here, that the people who proposed the bill in Queensland uh, said that a priest can learn of something two different ways. I actually thought this was kind of like a little theological conundrum. Somebody knew something of what they were talking about. And they said, a, uh, a, you know, a, a, an abuser can come in and confess, Boston Father, you know, I abused a whatever, 11-year-old or something. But, and they said, well, you know, that's confessional matter. But if the 11-year-old boy comes in and he's confessing, I don't know, he hit his sister or something, and in the process of confessing his sins reveals that he is a victim of abuse, which is not a sin on his part, no. the uh, Queensland person who proposed that, the lawmaker, said that's not a sin, mm -hmm. so it's not covered by the seal of confession. Okay. And I thought, well, isn't that a nice little twisting around of things? Yeah, it is. Anything, yeah, anything that's said from the second you go in the name of the Father until the priest says go in peace, yeah. anything talked about in there is under the seal. Whether you're actually confessing a sin or not, it's all under the seal. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think we need to, just to clarify, because there's going to be people watching this who are saying, you know, well, oh my gosh, you know, priests are already mandatory reporters if they learn about this sort of thing in many jurisdictions. The important thing is, is, is it's that thing that was in there, and it says that the priests are afraid that people will stop coming to confession. Well, because they will, absolutely. They, they that's, terrified of coming. that's what it's about. So the priest doesn't come along and say, oh, you know, three Hail Marys and we're good and, and go ahead and we're fine. No, the, the priest would counsel the individual and say, look, you really need to get help with this. You need to 
to go yourself oh, exactly. and report this. You need to give this up. You yeah. need to stop. You need to do this. But to make it mandatory strikes at the heart of what confession does, which allows people to uh, unburden themselves uh, of their sins in a safe environment, which allows them to seek the help that they need in order to uh, address these concerns. And uh, on this side of the ocean, Donald Trump is putting some heavy hitters on his newest Supreme Court nominee list. Now, the president revealed yesterday conservative senators Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, and Tom Cotton are on his list for his second term appointees of uh, uh, Supreme Court nominees. About 30 minutes after Trump's announcement, Tom Cotton tweeted, quote, it's time for Roe v. Wade to go. Uh, conservatives have, of course, been broadly pleased with uh, Trump's uh, Supreme, Court, Supreme Court appointees so far and his other appointees, the Supreme Court gets all the headlines, because obviously very important, nine men and women in black robes sitting there in Washington, DC, but the federal courts at lower levels they're the real importance, actually. He's, he's remade about a third of it. He has, because the whole thing is Obama didn't appoint as many nominees. He didn't appoint as many people up, so there were these holes there, and also the Senate was kind of blocking a lot of his more radical appointees. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, in, in, look, in, fa in fairness and kudos to Mitch McConnell, yeah. he said, yeah, you can appoint as many, you know, nominate as many people as you want. We're just not going to hear the nominations. I mean, Mitch, Mitch McConnell <laughs> is doing some tremendous he's, he's quite a quiet work <laughs> there in there. But um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, who is on the Supreme Court, she said, very canny woman, she said um, that the longest lasting and most damaging legacy of Trump, because obviously she's not a Trump fan, is his appointment of uh, federal judges, federal. not just Supreme Court, but federal. So they I'm quite 35, excited. 35,000 cases a year, only about 100 make it up to the Supreme Court. Yeah. The real work is done down at the federal level. Yeah, that's where... The appellate uh, judges. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where it all happens. And of course, as well, that's where these um, Supreme Court candidates are coming from. They're coming up right. through the ranks. So this is actually, I mean, I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg said it was like, you know, 50, 60 years of impact that this would have. So it's actually, it's, it's kind of yeah, good. And the interesting thing on this, you think back, you know, she said herself back in, I want to say it was around 2000, maybe 2010, uh, she said that the Supreme Court should never have decided Roe v. Wade. Right. That little by little, the states were turning in favor of it, and you know, it would have just sort of naturally evolved. But you sort of introduced this flashpoint into American culture, and now the entire American body politic revolves around that 1973 decision. She's right. I mean, I'm, I obviously don't want the states to all go pro-abortion, but she's right as far as the political impact of Roe v. Wade. To this day, here we are, what, 40-something yep. years later, yep. still abortion. Well, that's it for today's top stories. Right after the break, we'll be back to talk about Democrats hijacking the election. What are they up to? Nothing more central to humanity could exist beyond the real presence of Jesus Christ hiding himself under the appearance of bread and wine. Trump's presidency, patriotic Americans have had to endure, good word, endure, Democrat manufactured scandals one after another trying to turn public opinion against Trump. But since all their schemes have fizzled out, including the Russia collusion story, now they're turning to different and more dire tactics. Simon. Church Milton's Joseph Enders is reporting how mail-in balloting is just one of their new schemes and one that could upend the republic. If we went to mail-in balloting, our election all over the world would look as a total joke. It would be a total joke. Left-wing elites are admitting they intend to use mail-in voting to oust President Trump, the CEO of Hawkfish Polling Agency, founded by leftist billionaire mogul Michael Bloomberg, expects Biden to win with votes counted after Election Day. We might have the results saying something on the evening of November 3rd, that it will not say the evening of November 10th. The group openly admits that mail-in voting initiatives disproportionately help Democrats. We see in the data that twice as many voters intend to cast a ballot by mail than have ever before. They are disproportionately Joe Biden supporters. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced last week that allowing mail-in voting after election day is legitimate. Um, there's nothing illegitimate about 
this election taking additional days or even weeks um, to make sure that all the votes are counted. Last month, two-time presidential loser Hillary Clinton told Biden not to concede. Joe Biden should not concede under any circumstances because I think this is going to drag out and eventually I do believe he will win if we don't give an inch. No, no, but President Trump and his administration outlined the dangers of mail-in ballots. Last week, Attorney General William Barr explained the dangers to CNN's Wolf Blitzer. People who get them are not the right people. They're people who have replaced the, the previous occupant, and they can make them out. And sometimes multiple ballots come to the same address with a whole genera several generations of occupants. Do you think that's a way to run a vote? Despite the Trump administration's efforts to curb the talks of mail-in voting, leftist elites are leaving the faithful worried about America's election process being hijacked. Joseph Enders, Church Militant, Detroit. Yeah, we really have a problem here with this because the post office itself has been on decline. The ability yeah. to manage their own business has been on decline. And it's not something new. It's not Trump's fault. Yeah. It goes back decades, actually 2007 till present, so until 2018, they lost something like $69 billion. You know, if you're losing that much money, maybe you're not doing something right. They also run up overtime costs while their volume is going down. The internet volume, the internet itself, mm -hmm has taken away so much of their volume because you get stuff through the internet all the time. So while their volume is going down, you have at the same time, their overtime costs are skyrocketing, $1.5 billion increase in overtime costs. And it's like, how is this happening when you have so much less to manage? The fact that it goes back all the way to Obama's time when you have the, uh, uh, this problem was recognized back in the era of well before Trump with Obama himself closing 80 post offices, closing 12,000 uh, mailboxes. So he's already trying to cut all the costs here. You're having a tremendous restriction. Now, if you say, well, Pelosi just passed a bill just recently that says $25 billion are gonna go there. It's really not a cash on hand problem. They have something like $15 billion cash on hand. They have access to 10, 000, 10 billion, big B. $10 billion more in loans, they're solvent until August 2021. But the infrastructure, the facility itself, they are being blamed by the Democrats of saying, well, it's the post office is going to sabotage things. No, Democrats, it's you throwing all of this mail at a defunct postal service, which you know has already been defunct, and it's been that way for decades, and you're overloading a system that's already been Crashing. Yeah, when you think about what you, th what, you know, what's coming up uh, it, with the proposal that you know the, every Democrat, all the party leadership, all the talking points, everything in the media, mail in your ballots, mail in your ballots, mail in your ballots. Okay, mail in balloting just started uh, a, a few days ago and would run up to November third. So you're talking about know, 50 days or so. In 50 days, you're going to dump another two to three million pieces of mail on a post office that's already drowning under the weight of, you know, the, it can't handle what it's got already. Right. That's why the post office, Postmaster John Kevin said, no, 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 that's okay. We don't want to handle all the mail in ballots. And FedEx came out and said the same thing. Yeah. And UPS said, no, we don't want anything to do with that. Thank you very much. So now you're having a problem that was already easily foreseen by anybody looking at this situation of saying this is going to bring about chaos. Go to the polls and vote. Yeah. Like we've always done as a nation, go to the polls and vote. There's no mail-in balloting <laughs> thing in the 1918 influenza. Go to the polls and vote. One last thing on this is Biden is saying that, uh, well, Biden can't generate any, uh, you know, like Hillary Clinton. I can't get people off the couch. All of these activists, I can't get them off the couch to go to the polls. Out of their mom's basement. Okay, right. But if I have a ballot right here, you're going to have at least more turnout for the Democrats because all I got to do is check a box and throw it in. I don't have to find anything. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, when you look at the, the Democrats have this uh, uh, project, I suppose you'd call it, going on called the Transition Integrity Project. They're sort of pushing, I guess you could say, for a constitutional crisis. I mean, it's kind of what they're looking to do. This Transition Integrity Project is kind of like a, uh, a war game strategy. They produce this paper here, uh, sort of a white paper report, and they go through it and they're looking at all of these sort of different scenarios of how is the election actually going to play out. And they actually bring up some pretty good points and during the course of all this, of course, they're trying to make Donald Trump look like this angry, mean loser uh, and everything about him. It says, you know, I mean, look at that picture. It's an Associated Press picture if I ever saw one. But, you know, their points are here that the concept of election night 
is no longer accurate and is indeed dangerous. That's one of the points of the paper. You know, Donald Trump is a horrible person. Uh, a determined campaign has the opportunity to contest the election into January of 2021. We'll talk about that. And the administrative transition process itself may be highly disrupted. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's extremely important to understand what happens when you have, when you, when you, I mean, you push back the election, you push back the announcement of the winner, and then the person becomes the formal, you know, president-elect when the electoral college voters go and cast their votes in the beginning part of December. If all of that doesn't happen, and it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back, you don't know who the winners are, well, you, you know, you have to assemble a transition team, possibly, if Biden wins. Uh, but nonetheless, you still have to put your people in place and all of this kind of, it, it, it's insane to think that this just keeps going back and keeps going back and keeps going back. And of course, if it goes back to uh, January 20th, the 20th Amendment of the Constitution kicks in and the House, forget all the voting, it's all over, it doesn't matter. All those ballots, all that stuff, it's all over. All the, the House, U.S. House of Representatives votes in the president. Mm. That's it. And that's that, a very that's scary thing. And that's why they're all so telling Joe Biden, saying, you know, they're all saying, oh, for goodness sakes, Joe, you know, don't concede. You know, when he was at his uh, giving his acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention a couple of weeks back, he's there, he's pleading, he's looking, oh, you know, he's reading off the teleprompters. The only time he can actually sound coherent, sort of. Uh, and shortly after this, everybody, Hillary Clinton, everybody on the Democratic side, so don't you concede, don't you concede, Nancy Pelosi, don't you concede. Why? They don't want him to concede for the one reason that if January 20th, high noon comes, and there is no president-elect to stand there and take the oath of office, the U.S. House of Representatives votes in the President of the United States. It doesn't necessarily have to be Nancy Pelosi. They can vote in you. They can vote in anybody they want. They probably, won't, they probably won't vote you. Vote me. That's true. Not a natural well, They should be they taking odds down in Vegas on if they can put in but Hillary or... There, there, there are two quotes from this uh, transition project I just want to cover very quickly. Uh, one says that we assess that there is a chance right here. The President will attempt to convince legislatures, state legislatures and or governors to take actions, including illegal actions, to defy the popular vote. I mean, this is a clear, obviously it's a democratic project. Uh, planners need to take seriously the notion that this may well be a street fight, not a legal battle. Technocratic solutions, courts, and reliance on elites observing norms are not the answer here. This sounds like a sort of warmed over version of what BLM does yeah. and Antifa does if they're able to get this pushed off. A, a winner being declared pushed off, let's hit the streets, guys. Yeah, let's hit the streets. And I think that what you actually look at there is you actually look at sort of a, essentially a coup. You're looking at this kind of like coup, uh, which is, they're talking about violence. So when you say it's a street fight, okay, you're not meaning street fight in a metaphorical sense because you say this isn't, uh, you know, about uh, technocratic solutions, legal battles. You're not saying this is going to be contentious in the courts. You're saying this is going to be baseball bats with nails driven through it. The professional purveyors of violence in the United States have always been the United States military. He's done a very good job of it. And there is a lot of discussion about this actually being a military coup in order to remove Trump. Now, we think of the idea of the United States military as a very conservative institution. And broadly speaking, the rank and file are, but uh, the above administration spent a lot of political capital purging the officer corps, including the upper echelons, of anyone who was conservative and putting in essentially Democrats in khaki Absolutely. there, or, or olive drab as, as, as the American military was. Um, and actually Mad Dog Mattis, who was former Secretary of Defense, he's actually uh, quoted in Bob Woodward's new book as saying, there may come a time when we kind of the military, have to take collective action, saying and he says, Trump is dangerous and he's unfit. Now, this isn't just a question of like some crazy conspiracy theory that some you know, real fringe elements are talking about like the military gonna have to step in to remove Trump. Actually, the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, Vice President Joe Biden, former Senator Joe Biden, he's actually said, yep, we're gonna have to step in and, and remove Trump. Let's take a listen. And you have so many rank and file military personnel saying, whoa, we're not a military state. This is not who we are. I promise you, I'm absolutely convinced they will escort him from the White House in a, in a, with great dispatch. So the whole thing here is that there's this, there's this huge push on the left to essentially say that if Trump is defeated, 
they don't want him just to be defeated and Trump just to go, you know what, I lost them, walk out. They don't want that. They want the drama. They want the, the thing. They want this satisfactory end to their narrative. They're actually, oh, he's a bad man and he refused to accept and, the rule of and law. And he's illegitimate. And he's illegitimate. He always, always was. Always wasn't. And, and we exactly knew it all along yeah. and now this proves it. That's but with regard end. to this whole like illegitimacy thing and he doesn't respect the rule of law, let's take a look at Antifa and all these things that were happening in places like Portland and up in Seattle and all this sort of stuff. This is some city in the United States, one urban area. I honestly yeah. don't know which I one. I can't tell. Because it could have been so many because so many of our beautiful cities were turned into war zones there um, over the, the, the summer that uh, there was no rule of law in large areas of cities going on for months, weeks and months at a time. There was no sense of order. And this is the whole idea. When Trump mentioned, and this is kind of the scary thing, when Trump mentioned his use possibly of the Insurrection Act, the whole idea was, you know, you, you use the military to uh, enforce peace when uh, the local law enforcement can't do this. The Joint Chiefs of Staff pushed back and essentially said, we won't do it, which arguably is why he didn't well, pull I, the I trigger I totally understand. I was following this story back uh, under Obama's era when he was gutting the, the middle brass mm -hmm. out and he was actually purging. I don't know if it was 150, 200 or more of the solid middle yep. men managers in the military. Uh, you get the majors and the colonels in there. Uh, we hear about the deep state, you know, how they were against, you know, the FBI, CIA, all this stuff was against Trump. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the military, too? There was a remaking of that yeah. under yeah, Obama. I mean, all, all of the governmental institutions were remade under Obama. And, and then Trump has to inherit all that. Yeah, and, and this is obviously all the deep state stuff. I want to go back, though, we've just got a little bit of time here to talk about this mail-in balloting uh, issue. Uh, you know, because this, all of the things we're talking about here about riots in the streets, this, all of that's predicated on the fact that come election night or a day or so after, we don't have a winner. No. That's what it's predicated on. So at that point, okay, now we have to send in the military, get Trump out, or you know, you know, or you know, who's going to be, you know, uh, you know, declared president by the U.S. House of Representatives, and we're going to have street fights and all this stuff and everything. You know, it's all predicated on this. You know, I, I got this the other day. I said, oh, I'm going to bring this in on a show. This is a mail-in ballot from the state of Michigan for the Michigan primaries. Uh, I never requested this. I went and voted. Matter of fact, when I was filling in my little thing for Donald Trump, I held my phone and I tweeted it. I tweeted out me circling in for Donald Trump. All of a sudden, this is a ballot that comes rolling up to my home address. That's my home address on it, wherever that is. You know, I'm like, I didn't ask for this. Where did this come from? And it comes from the city of Ferndale. That's where I drop it off to. But I don't, I don't know what mechanism happened behind the scenes. Yeah. And here's another little thing. So, you know, you open up the ballot. And there's your instructions on how to cheat for Biden. I mean, how to fill it out. Um, so here's the, here's the ballot. Sit down and fill the whole thing out. Now, normally, in the state of Michigan, and many states do this, others do it different ways, they give you a great big, huge sleeve that you put this in and you, and you feed it into a machine. You, know, you fill out your little oval holes or whatever and you feed it in the machine. No human being ever touches this. No. You're the last human being to touch it. It goes in and that's it. Uh, and it, you know, it's all recorded and scanned and the little vote happens and that's over. You here with a mail-in ballot, you take this, you put it in what they say here, and you probably can't see this here, but it says secrecy sleeve right across there, which is a nice little like psych out job. You stick it in there and then you stick your little thing in here and you mail it in. This gets opened by a human being. This gets opened by a human being. How all of a sudden is my, I mean, that it's not my vote is probably not known because it doesn't say where it came from, but a vote is known. And what happens if the dude opening this up or the woman opening this up at the county register's office or the city of clerks or whoever's doing the counting, what happens if that person is a Biden supporter? They, and they go, oh, we don't look at it. And I just, I take this and I just feed it in. Oh, oh really? You pull this out like two more inches and you can see, yeah. is it Trump or is it Biden? You feed the thing through, you're like, oh, well, let's, uh, that's a Trump vote. Yeah. Oh, I don't know where that went. Yeah. There's, this destroys the whole integrity of the election system because now you don't know. I don't know. There are 130 million people roughly voted in the 2016. Everybody's expecting it's going to be more. You wind up with, I mean, the presidency was determined by less than 100,000 votes scattered around three states. You don't think in 140, 150 million votes with a huge number of them being mail-in that, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 might shift around here or there. You got some shifty court clerks who just buried votes for Trump. You walk out of the election going, I, I don't actually know who really won. 
Only God knows who actually won this election. The other thing that allows you is you could vote twice. Sure. Yeah, you I could have voted twice. I could have voted twice. Again, I voted. I got proof. So I here voted. You, here you vote <laughs> twice and, you know. Why can't I send twice? in another vote right now? Yeah. I mean, I didn't, obviously. Vote early and vote often. That's yeah, what I yeah. I, I, you know, I'm waiting for one to show up for my dad. Mm -hmm. I'll vote for my dad, too. God rest his soul. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, if all this doesn't convince you to get on your knees and pray for our election, nothing will. We'll be right back after this. Church Militant is working behind the scenes with law enforcement and whistleblowers. It's a classic case of putting the fox in charge of the hen house. To help expose corruption and abuse, all with the goal of removing, prosecuting, or, if necessary, imprisoning compromised clergy. Investigators, law enforcement, whistleblowers, we invite you to work with us through Church Militant's Action Arm. What's evident from all this chaos is our country is in dire straits at just about every level. We are in historic times, and as Catholics, we need to do everything possible to preserve our families and our cities and our country, obviously, from destruction. God is calling every single one of us to be heroes, and he's given us the tools, the sacraments, and praying the daily rosary, as well as the ability to act in the material order according to our own life's circumstances. We here at Church Milton have started our 54-day Rosary Novena for our nation this week. If you haven't joined in, don't worry, it's not too late. Just join us every weekday at 8 a.m. Eastern Time here at churchmilton.com. That's it for today. We'll see you again right here tomorrow on the download. God bless you.